So hello for this uh, seminar in the HEAR seminar series Genomics. Uh, today I'd like to present Lucy van Dopp from the UCL uh, in London. Uh, Lucy did her PhD in human population genetics, working on both ancient and modern human genomic data. And then she moved, moved to microbial genomics, where she's still at, working on modern bacterial genomic data to address questions relating to drivers of diversity in major hospital pathogens. And then in 2022, um, she was awarded a UCLA Excellence Fellowship, after which she was heavily involved in the genomic analysis of SARS-CoV-2 during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2023, she was awarded the uh, Balfour Lecture from the Genetic Society for contributions to genetics from an early career investigator. And currently, she's a group leader in microbial genetics at UCL Genetics Institute. And her current body of work looks to build evolutionary approaches to understanding infectious diseases, epidemiology, using genomics, working at both ancient and recent timescales. So I'll leave the talk to her. <laughs> Thanks very much, Miriam. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, and today I want to really give you, I guess, a, an overview of some of our research interests of the kind of overarching theme of tracking zoonotic pathogens in space and in time. And I kind of caveated this talk as something old, something new, and that's because I'm going to spend probably the first half of the talk giving you some examples of where we've worked on um, very ancient events in the history of kind of zoonotic disease, and then spend the second half bringing you right up to speed to how we can use genomic toolkits and some of the techniques that um, are, are used to understand pathogens at many timescales to address modern disease threats. Um, and when I say zoonotic, oops. Mm. Interesting. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, so I'll start off by what I mean by zoonotic disease, and this is microorganisms that can spread from animals to humans. And the reason we care about them is because most emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. So current estimates suggest there are around about 250 known zoonotic viruses and about 450 known zoonotic bacteria. So there's very many to be keeping us busy. And some of them have been plaguing us for really a very long time. So here's a timeline um, where I can map on the estimated age of emergence of some of the major um, human associated pathogens. Now, some of these are thought to be very, very ancient diseases. So good example are malarial parasites, hepatitis B, tuberculosis, and plague. Whereas others are far more recent events with HIV and COVID-19 being striking examples. But actually you can see the kind of confidence intervals around these events are enormous. And really there are major uncertainties about how long some of our major human pathogens have been infecting um, humans. And also what those original animal reservoirs might have been giving rise to the zoonotic event. And that's really despite the fact that for many of these pathogens, so um, malaria, uh, influenza, um, HIV, they're all good examples where we have thousands and thousands of modern genomes. And so really my work argues that kind of innovative approaches are required to map zoonotic disease emergence from its source to established infection to adaptation at different timescales. Now, one possible solution to this challenge of looking really far back in time to understand the pathogens that we've kind of evolved with and been exposed to is to start to look for the evidence of infections from the past in genomic material. And I know many of you here are working on ancient DNA and of course, in and amongst the sequencing reads generated from an ancient sample and not just those that are endogenous to the sample in terms of the host, but also there's a huge repertoire of microorganisms present. And so if we can disentangle which of those uh, DNA sequencing reads might belong to different pathogens of interest, suddenly we're able to push back what we can say using evolutionary frameworks by filling in with direct observation, um, ancient observations from the past. Now, I think some of the kind of oldest and most interesting viral infections are found amongst the family of double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, uh, certainly a suite of them, and I've kind of highlighted um, adenovirus here and herpes virus here, are very, very common. They're very prevalent in childhood, and they typically have reasonably low virulence for most infections. And for some, like herpes virus, that low virulence can manifest as kind of latent infections with the virus evolving alongside the host over, over many thousands of years. And so this has led some people to speculate that these types of viruses have coexisted with humans as a species, perhaps evolving and co-diverging um, with us. 
And so I was involved in a project where we were able to identify, I think, some of the oldest infections to date that were found in amongst this, this family of viruses. So in particular, by screening the sequencing reads of uh, two unrelated children from the archaeological site of Yana in northeastern Siberia, we were able to identify the pathogens that were, that were present. For those of you who work on uh, human ancient DNA, you might recognize that these are the two unrelated uh, individuals or children that yielded very high coverage human genomes that were really formative in understanding kind of Pleistocene migrations in this region of the world. But in and amongst those sequencing reads of, of these uh, childhood milk teeth, were also sequencing reads that could be assigned to at least four species of herpes virus and um, two observations of sequencing reads that could be assigned to human adenovirus uh, C, so one of these adenovirus species. And so one of, uh, of these adenovirus uh, genomes were actually reasonably good coverage. So for, for one of the individuals, we were able to recover a 5X genome. You can see the kind of distribution over the, the reference genome here. And for the other, a 1X genome. And using kind of the standard authentication tools to say, OK, we believe that these genomes look authentically ancient. They exhibit kind of the characteristic damage patterns and also that they look very much like human adenovirus C rather than one of the other adenovirus species. This really allowed us to provide kind of direct genomic evidence that these viruses that have been hypothesized to be really very old and have a very deep history of humans. Well, we have direct observation that they were in existence in human populations since at least the Pleistocene. Now, when you have observations like this, and this is obviously an exciting observation, one instant question is, well, how does that fit into our understanding of the contemporary adenovirus infections that many children are experiencing today? And so adenovirus C today um, is or can be defined as, uh, by a set of genotypic markers. Um, so I've got some of them uh, positioned up here. It's a really interesting virus in that it's pretty freely recombining, except over some parts of the genome. And those are the kind of the outer surface proteins, so the hexon, the fiber, and the penton. And so what we could do is take our uh, two uh, genomes from each of these two children and move along the genome and say, well, how does this match up to the modern genotypes? So each line here is a, a modern genotype, um, and the kind of a one here shows a high identity, so it's average nucleotide identity on the y-axis. So you can see as we move along the genome, kind of everything's much more muchness, and then we get to these key marker proteins where you can see that the top viral genome matches most closely to the light blue at both hexon and fiber, whereas the uh, slightly lower coverage genome here matches most closely to the, the C1 or the dark blue, which um, this is kind of a striking observation because it suggests not only do we have these um, viruses that are existing in Pleistocene children, but also we have two different genotypes. Um, it also suggests that the genotype, genotypic kind of approach and markers that are used today to characterize modern infections kind of seem to hold up if we look at infections that are up to 30,000 years old. And so this kind of suggests that we, we must have, you know, the same site, we have two different genotypes in circulation. Um, these individuals are sort of estimated to have died around the same time, it's just quite a bit of diversity. And so a more formal way of assessing this is to build phylogenetic trees um, of the viral populations. So here we have each dot is a, a modern infection of human adenovirus C. There's about 85 here, with the color again showing these uh, genotypic markers that are used to define infections today. And we can place into that phylogenetic framework the two genomes from these uh, Pleistocene children. And uh, they sit around here. So we have the, the one that's falling in the light blue genotype or genotype T, falling basal, and then this other um, of a lower coverage genome is falling uh, basal to the genotype C1. Now, one major advantage, if you're interested in the history of pathogens, such as I am, is having, having these kind of old observations, is it allows us to estimate or recalibrate phylogenetic trees, not by just substitutions per site, but by, by time. And so in this case, we are able to leverage the fact that we had these two ancient calibration points to um, ascertain a molecular clock or evolutionary pattern across human adenovirus C. Now, I mentioned this is a really freely recombining virus, apart from these key marker regions. So we took a number of approaches to try and identify recombinant tracks, uh, remove them, screen them out, and also to remove many incongruent sites or homoplasies within the alignment to leave us with a, a shorter alignment that was kind of measurably evolving. And this allows us then to take a phylogenetic tree like this and at any point along the x-axis draw off a, a unit time or estimate. And so perhaps one of the most interesting estimates, if, if you do these kinds of approaches, is, well, when would we say that all the circulating human adenovirus C last shared a common ancestor? And we would estimate that that time window, and it is a time window, it's obviously not a point estimate, is between, say, 489 or 963,000 years or so ago. 
And this is obviously a really interesting time period. If we think about current ideas about the split time of Homo sapiens from its nearest ancestors, we're looking at a period which overlaps with these types of estimates. So this kind of uh, evolutionary picture that we're saying, okay, here's a common ancestor and emergence event of human adenovirus C does seem to fit quite well with this um, hypothesis about a co-divergent scenario. However, one thing we also found really interesting in this phylogenetic tree is if we look at the modern genotypes, so the kind of genotypes we have circulating today, you can see that on these types of timescales, they emerged really quite recently. So we would estimate, you know, all of these modern genotypes are dating to within the last, say, 70,000 or so years. And of course, again, if you're interested in the possibility of a co-divergence scenario and an intrinsic relationship with the human host, this is a period that falls very nicely with the, the period of the out of Africa migrations. So one possible hypothesis at, at this point is that we have circulating or kind of extensive diversity of human adenovirus C in Africa. Um, and then the migrations of humans out of Africa took those uh, these genotypes that we still experience today. So there's been a large amount of population continuity leading to the distribution that, that we observe today. Now, actually, and I think it's a, an equally plausible um, hypothesis, given the kind of data we have at the moment, is that it could be the case that there's a very deep structure that we observe of human adenovirus C didn't emerge within Homo sapiens, but perhaps in another um, Homo species, um, with Neanderthals being a potential, um, potential candidate because we know that there was contact between Neanderthals and modern humans during the out of Africa migrations. And older genomes and, and more genomes are going to help to start to disentangle these types of hypotheses. And this is work that was really led by uh, Sophie Holtzett Nielsen, who came and spent a, a period of time working with us at UCL Genetics Institute. Um, so what about the herpes viridae reads? So this is again, another really common double-stranded DNA virus. Um, one particular species, herpes simplex virus one, which I'm gonna call HSV1 from now on, is really, really common. About half of us in this room probably have it, at least in a dormant state. Um, you probably have heard of it as, as, or know of it as causing uh, cold sores or oral or herpes. Um, and in this case, um, we, we also have the suggestion of a kind of similar entwined relationship between HSV1 and um, uh, Homo sapiens. And this is really based on the evidence for this so far is based on efforts to genotype modern diversity, which tends to find that there's groups of HSV1 which can be split into an African phyla group, a European phyla group, and a Eurasian phyla group. And this relationship with the African phyla group always falling very basal has been taken as potential evidence of an African origin and, and dissemination route for, for HSV1. And I say that, but not that long ago, there was a, a paper out which um, claimed something a bit different in that as yes, again, observed this kind of African group that was falling basal, but instead suggested that the event that gave rise to the diversity of HSV1 was something that was much more recent. So this paper in particular estimated an out of Africa migration for this viral species, say within the last 5,000 years. And so this is another great example of where there can be major inconsistencies in our understanding of the age of even you know, these exceedingly common pathogens. And again, we can kind of turn back to the infections of our predecessors, which may well hold uh, some clues. Interestingly, this map has nothing on it, which it does uh, on my laptop. Um, but you'll have to trust me that this is a, a map that gives some of the contemporary infections that we observe in HSV1. And actually, as a side note, that is an important map. And you're just going to have to believe me, because it really shows that even today, for a really common virus, the sampling of modern infections is pretty bad. So um, I think that's worth bearing in mind, even for these very common pathogens, what we know today, um, even using modern data, can often be quite biased. So there are very few samples from Africa, from um, parts of kind of Eurasia, and a very heavy intensity of sampling within the USA, which... Um, in terms of understanding the ancestral, ancestral history of the virus is, is a very admixed population. And so if we want to kind of learn something about HSV1's history, potentially ask these big questions about how long it's been infecting us, um, then we have to, to look back <laughs> to, to ancient DNA. And so I was involved in a project together with Merriam, um, University of Cambridge, and, and the After the Plague team also in Cambridge, looking and hunting for the presence of HSV1 sequencing reads in uh, human archaeological uh, sequenced remains, uh, particularly looking at teeth and also very interestingly, the molar apical root, which seems to be a much better source of HSV1 uh, compared to looking at calculus, for instance. And so um, we were able to identify uh, four infections in the past. So the first was from uh, this adult male from the Ural Mountains in Russia, dating to 1500 years ago. And that individual through shotgun sequencing, we were able to recover an HSV1 genome at 5.4x coverage. 
And then we had two individuals from Cambridge. So um, one, a medieval young adult male from St. John's Cemetery site. Uh, this was part of the After the Plague project, uh, yielding a viral genome at 9.5x coverage. And then a further Anglo-Saxon female also in Cambridge from the site of Edix Hill, again, yielding a, a 4x genome. And then we were also able to identify one further individual, much more recent, uh, likely involved uh, or died during a village massacre found on the banks of the Rhine. And this individual um, who died in, or is estimated to have died in 1692, yielded a viral genome of 1.2x coverage, so a little bit lower coverage. So generally for most of our analysis, we took forward these, these top three. Um, and you can see this together, this kind of motley crew of different individuals actually helps us to extend back the genomic observations of the history of HSV1 by 1500 um, years. So just as before, one major question is, well, if we have those ancient infections, how do they fit into our understanding of infections today? Um, so one way of representing this, and this is a kind of a, a useful way of representing diversity in a virus like HSV1, which is very highly recombining, is to use something called a split tree network. And you can see from this kind of split tree, we can approximately split out this African grouping in orange, uh, this uh, European grouping in mostly red, and then this Eurasian grouping falling into this, this other branch. Now, the arrows here point out where these uh, free higher coverage HSV1 from, from historic and ancient individuals um, fit in. So again, we have a scenario a bit like we saw with adenovirus uh, C in that these um, infections in the past are falling into diverse uh, genotypes. Um, again, HSV1 is highly recombining, so we could also use population genetic-based approaches to try and understand the kind of population clustering of these different groups of infections. So in particular, we used a haplotype-based method that's designed to move along the genome and identify chunks of DNA that any two viral genomes might share in common and leverage that uh, patterning in order to be able to cluster, cluster groups. And generally, we find that that yields a much finer level of, of resolution than using alternative approaches. And doing this, again, you can kind of see this free clade structure, and then we have the two um, ancient and historic individuals uh, falling into distinct parts. And so given we know the age of these individuals from radiocarbon dating, this tells us that there's kind of the divergence of these clades must be at least 1,500 years old. We can do this a little bit more formally. So I've mentioned there's big kind of controversy or inconsistencies in our understanding of the, the time scales over the, the evolutionary history of HSV1 by using phylogenetic approaches. So here we um, moved along the HSV1 genome, looking at our modern data, looking at our past infections, and we're able to identify chunks of genome that look like they were incongruent with the major phylogeny, suggesting that they may have been in implicated in recombination events. Removing those out, because those don't carry useful signal for us in terms of being able to calibrate a molecular clock, we generated a topology which looks a bit like this. And we're able to estimate that over part of this topology, so not the whole topology, we could estimate a kind of evolutionary signal. So that's this top part here where we saw a meaningful accumulation of mutations over the time of sampling of our data set. And this is the kind of raw ingredients you need to be able to apply temporal approaches, particularly phylogenetic tip dating to estimate uh, or recalibrate uh, phylogenetic trees by time. And so we took forward that portion of the phylogenetic tree, and that portion corresponded to all the European all the, and all the Asian, so the Eurasian diversity that we currently see in HSV1, including our um, historic individuals. And so again, this tree can now be calibrated by time along the x-axis. And what's really interesting, if we go back to this key event, so the, the estimate of when we would say that all of these uh, viral genomes last share a common ancestor, we land on something about four and a half thousand years ago. And I think when we got these results, we were all a little bit surprised. And that's because this you know, hypothesis and longstanding hypothesis about you know, very integral and, and um, perhaps a very, very ancient relationship between humans or um, genus Homo with HSV1 doesn't really bear out if we think all Eurasian diversity originated four and a half thousand years ago. And of course, we also have observations in the sequencing reads from our Pleistocene children that indicate that they were carrying some kind of HSV1 infection. And so our kind of working hypothesis, given these kind of conflicting bodies of, of evidence, is that we have a case where we have one lineage that about four and a half thousand years ago spread throughout Europe and Asia. And during that process, erased the diversity that was present tens of thousands of years before. And of course, this four and a half thousand year old period in Eurasia is, is a busy time. This is, this is the, the period of the Bronze Age where there's lots of mass migration movement and changes in cultural practice. And so perhaps it's not inconceivable that we might have some change in the, the transmission patterns of a very human um, or intrinsic human virus. <laughs> 
And so we kind of had to think about what possible hypotheses could be. Um, so one is we looked at the kind of functionally relevant mutations that we see infections in infections today, looked at them back in our ancient historic samples and said, well, do we see anything different? And actually we didn't really, and that is based on our modern understanding of how HSV1 behaves, but it doesn't seem to us that there was a big change functionally in the phenotype of the virus between historic times and free to today. Another possible hypothesis is that we, we know the Bronze Age is a period of migration and it's um, a perhaps under-recognized force of, of distribution of genotypes of pathogens, humans, and everything else. It's just a simple role of one uh, lineage happening to be in a group that happened to be moving and um, introduced as, as, for example, a founder effect, leading to that becoming a dominant lineage today. The other kind of hypothesis we had is that today we um, are kind of our understanding of HSV1 transmission is it's predominantly uh, mother to child, um, so vertical, but can also be transmitted horizontally, uh, particularly through oral contact. And I think as a group, we were kind of speculating as the time and it occurred to us that um, one possible means of oral contact is, of course, kissing. Now, it turns out kissing is a far from universal practice in human populations around the world. And some of the earliest kind of written evidence of kissing uh, dates to around the Bronze Age period. We also know that maybe 300 years later or so, Emperor Tiberius was said to have banned kissing at events because of concerns over the spread of disease. So while this is, of course, just a wild speculation, I think it does um, allow us to think hard about how our relationship with pathogens is also very intrinsic to our relationship with us. And it could be that we had a case where some change in the transmission or dominant form of transmission of this virus gave one lineage a, a leg up. And that's why we observe this uh, intriguing pattern of diversity really dating back to quite recent times in the history of what is thought to be and observed to be a, a very um, ancient virus. And this is work, as I mentioned, I was uh, really pleased to work with Maryam on and also led by Christiane Scheib and, and Charlotte Hallcroft at the University of Cambridge. And this kind of closes the, I guess, something old part of the talk, um, but I think it's a nice lead into the something um, new. And I say that because I've discussed this kind of prehistoric lineage replacement events occurring in HSV1, and that might feel quite far removed, but of course, lineage replacement of viruses is something we've all experienced in the last three years. Um, during the kind of the, the period of um, experiencing and from my perspective, studying the emergence of what's probably the most intensively studied uh, virus to date, which is of course SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I wanted to kind of touch on how the methods that we can use for reconstructing pathogen histories and autism disease histories on the order of thousands of years can be used to track the evolution of viruses like SARS-CoV-2 at the order of weeks or potentially um, even days. And so um, I thought I'd start by just giving you a sense of the kind of data we're working with. And often when I talk to, um, I guess, microbial genomicists, they hear about my work on ancient DNA and they think, oh, that's such an unusual sample. But I might argue that the, the sample that kind of we're working with in the context of SARS-CoV-2 is, is equally unusual. And that's because it's absolutely enormous. Um, so on this plot, and this is a plot actually from quite a few years ago now, we have um, some of the major human viral pathogens, so dengue, um, Ebola, influenza A, MERS, SARS-CoV-2, and Zika. And the y-axis here is the number of genomes that are being submitted uh, from those different species. And you can see, uh, looking at this kind of vertical line, that in the matter of months, the genomic sequencing effort for SARS-CoV-2 really superseded anything that had ever been done before. And um, I think it was Friday when I last looked, the, the database, which has been enormously influential in terms of the understanding the genomics of SARS-CoV-2, um, GISAID, where most genomes are uploaded, had over 16 million uh, viral genomes. So that gives you um, some sense of the data. To kind of contextualize that, if we look back to the last pandemic for which there was really the ability to kind of use genomic, uh, genomic response, that was the influenza A pandemic or swine flu, uh, H1N1. Uh, this paper was uh, published in Science two months following the declaration of the pandemic, and it analyzed 11 partial genomes. Now, if we fast forward a decade or so in, in terms of looking at SARS-CoV-2, two months after the declaration of the pandemic, there are over 10,000 whole genome sequences available. And so I wanted to give you just a flavor of like the current diversity of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, typically when looking at the genomics of SARS-CoV-2, these kind of radial phylogenies are used because the data set is so huge. That being said, this is also a massively subsampled uh, phylogenetic tree. 
And so in the gray here, we kind of have the ancestral or the Wuhan uh, strains, and then we can move through kind of evolutionary time. The different colors here are representing the emergence of different uh, variants of concern. So lineages which were estimated or have been observed to have different phenotypic properties. And then we have this uh, long terminal branch leading to um, what is the Omicron variant of concern, which is currently what's in circulation today. And you can see that this variant is really um, been diversifying and evolving for quite a long time, so taking up a kind of a huge chunk of this phylogenetic tree. Now, another way of kind of observing this diversity is actually because we have so many viral genomes being submitted is simply to ask well, what proportion of genomes that are submitted belong to different uh, variants or lineages. Um, and that's this kind of plot along the top, which um, you can see we kind of have gray. So this is all the kind of pre-variant of concern lineages. And then here we have the emergence of alpha, for instance, uh, here's delta, and here's omicron. And I kind of think that's a useful representation because I think this, this observation that we have with HSV1 where you can have a lineage rise to fixation and you just lose any ability to observe what happened before is, is certainly something that we're seeing here on the scale of uh, months um, rather than, than uh, thousands of years, but it certainly seems to be a property of viral evolution. And I think uh, SARS-CoV-2 is really bringing that, has brought that to the fore as um, this kind of uh, birth and death style evolution of different viral lineages. So one advantage, if you're interested in the emergence of zoonotic disease at, at different scales um, of this data set, is that we have very many genomic observations from pretty early on in terms of the evolution of the virus. And this allows us to ask some questions about, well, what patterns do we observe in, in the early evolution when a new zoonotic virus enters a, a human host? And so this is a phylogenetic tree we built in about April 2020, so it encapsulates kind of the first... Um, well, the early part of the first pandemic uh, wave. I think there were about uh, 3,000 or so genomes in this phylogeny. And one thing that we found quite striking is um, the tips of this phylogenetic tree are colored by continental region, is that it was fairly limited what we would kind of call population structure or geographic structure with it within the data set. Um, one easier way of kind of showing that is if I highlight some key examples. So here we have the global phylogenetic tree with any dots in purple showing genomes from the USA, here we have genomes from the UK, where there was a very intensive sequencing effort, um, Iceland, and then China. Hopefully you can, I can't see it too well. But, but the point I'm trying to make is it was not the case that you could pluck one genome out and say, okay, this one is definitely, say, for instance, from the UK. Instead, any genome from the UK could basically be found at any point whole, across this whole phylogenetic tree. And this type of approach was done far more uh, formally, at least in the UK, by Duplessis and colleagues who were able to detect over a thousand independently introduced transmission lineages um, into the UK, peaking in mid-March of 2020. Um, this was an interesting observation at the time, because at the time there's an awful lot of press around um, patient zeros in different countries, for instance. And this type of work shows, well, in any one place, there were many, many, many patient zeros, many, many introductions happening at many, many times. And I think highlights the role of kind of globalization in our kind of modern experience of infectious diseases in disseminating lineages really extremely quickly. The other interesting observation, if we're kind of interested in this uh, you know, early emergence of a new pathogen, is if we look at the, um, the amount of genomic diversity. So the x-axis here is not scaled now by time, but simply by number of mutations. Uh, so here at zero, we have the original uh, Wuhan strain, and then we have a number of mut mutations accumulating since. And you can see that by uh, April 2020, there were very few genomes. There weren't many observations that had more than, say, 30 mutations from that original strain. Now, this is a 30 KB virus, so 30 mutations really isn't very much. And this really points to the fact that firstly, building phylogenetic trees like this, you're not using very much information. There aren't many mutations. So um, at this point, I think any two genomes taken at average differed by about 10 SNPs. Um, but also that this is really consistent with this being a very young virus, a really genetically homogeneous group. And even today, after all the discussion we've all heard in the media about endless variants and mutations, any two genomes on average share about 100, muta uh, differ by about 100 mutations. So it's still actually a, a really genetically homogeneous system. But oh, it's such a shame, my, for some reason, my plots are not showing everything. But we can use exactly the same approaches that we've used in the, the deep history of, say, human adenovirus C or HSV1 to ask some questions about when we would estimate that uh, the circulating diversity of SARS-CoV-2 last shared a common ancestor. And this relies on, and again, you're going to have to trust me, on a uh, root-to-tip correlation. So seeing this you know, very strong patterning of what we expect as, as kind of an evolutionary approach, the accumulation of mutations with time. <laughs> 
And this case and kind of all methods that, that rely on this type of signal to estimate or, or estimate kind of phylogenetic trees scaled by time use this, this as a, a fundamental premise. Um, we applied an approach called tree data simply because of the, the size of the data set. Um, so this allowed us to provide a phylogenetic tree, calibrate this tree by time. And in doing so, we could estimate this key kind of event. So when would we estimate the kind of common ancestor of all circulating SARS-CoV-2? Um, and this we could, you know, hypothesize dates back to the original zoonotic spillover. And so in doing this, we estimated a time, a window, a confidence interval, interval of between, say, early October 2019 through to early December 2019. And this also allowed us to estimate a mutation rate for SARS-CoV-2, which landed on about two or so mutations per genome per month, which is really quite slow, actually, for a virus, about two to six fold slower than, say, what we see in influenza viruses. And the, the luxury of working on a contemporary pathogen, which has been so well studied, is, of course, we can try and link back our understanding. We don't have to just speculate. <laughs> we can link back to kind of our known epidemiology of the situation at the time. So are these dates kind of credible? And so uh, some of the earliest semi-official cases known of SARS-CoV-2 in China date to uh, November the 17th, 2019. Um, and then we have reasonable evidence that SARS-CoV-2 was already circulating in Europe, so in France uh, in mid-December 2019, and in Italy, in Milan, Milan and Turin in December 2019. So the phylogenetic kind of estimate seems to, to bear witness to kind of there being uh, a kind of emergent state that, that's around this period. And of course, others and many others have looked at this question with different approaches and different data sets. And the general consensus is, is, is a kind of an average emergence date to around November of 2019. So I've kind of talked about this kind of early pattern and emergence in a new zoonotic virus, but um, if we have an emergence date in, say, November or so of 2019, and the first genome comes out in January of 2020, we're actually still missing perhaps some very important mutations during that early spillover event into humans. And so that doesn't particularly allow us to get at the processes which are allowing switching and establishment in a new host. Um, but there are some potential solutions or, or case studies that might help. And SARS-CoV-2 is another, another really good example of this um, because we have very many cases of spillovers of SARS-CoV-2 into different species from the human reservoir, as that's the process of anthroponosis. And of course, uh, because of the genomic sequencing effort, we have very many tracked examples sampled very, very intensively through time. So this allows us to have multiple independent observations of what happens every time there's a spillover event um, in, in a reasonably um, instantaneous way. And um, just to give you a sense of how common this is, um, this is a radial phylogenetic tree across uh, mammalian life. And oh, yes, the dots are here on this one. <laughs> Uh, if we go around the edge, everywhere that there's a dot, there's either been a reported natural infection with SARS-CoV-2 or infection has been um, successfully experimentally induced in a laboratory setting. And so hopefully what you can see from this is there's a lot of dots and they're not constrained to just one part of the mammalian phylogenetic tree. In fact, SARS-CoV-2 has infected or been observed to infect across nearly every order of mammals. So this is something that's happened again and again. Now, probably the example that you've all heard of would be um, infections of SARS-CoV-2 occurring in minks. So the first observation of SARS-CoV-2 circulating in mink farms dates to April 2020 in, in the Netherlands. And following those reports, multiple um, outbreaks are reported across Europe and then across uh, the world in, in uh, respective mink farms. A lot of media attention was around at the time due to infections, particularly in Denmark, in mink farms, where there was some concern that the lineage that was infecting minks might be requiring mutations that were adaptive in minks that potentially on spillback into humans might reduce the efficacy of the vaccine. And that led to Denmark taking the, the kind of enormous action to, to cull essentially all uh, minks within Denmark, which having looked into this, it turns out at the time there were more minks in Denmark than there were humans. So that was, of course, an enormous endeavor. A perhaps um, much less well-known um, example of a, of a really important animal reservoir for SARS-CoV-2 is in white-tailed deer. Um, and this is a very significant reservoir. So white-tailed deer, particularly in the US, are actually the land-based mammal with the highest biomass. And they carry an awful lot of SARS-CoV-2. So this was predominantly picked up by swabbing uh, nasopharyngeal swabs of deer during the hunting season and also seroprevalence estimates with some US states suggesting seroprevalence in white-tailed deer populations perhaps as high as 
And it seems also today that the, the viral lineages that are circulating in white-tailed deer, um, it's, it's really interesting that they seem to harbor some of the variants that are now extinct within humans. So for example, the alpha variant is still persisting in white-tailed deer, but, but isn't present in humans. So again, this raises some interesting observations and, and questions about, well, if we have different uh, variants evolving within different host selective pressures, should we, should we be concerned? And so to kind of answer this question about um, what happens right at the time period of, of a spillover event, at least in this case, um, we at the time um, took all uh, genomic data that had been um, obtained from SARS-CoV-2 in animal infections and compared that to a matched data set of infections of inhumans. At the time, and there's, there's very many more genomes now, this corresponds to a, a large amount of American mink, so 789 genomes from nine different countries. Uh, 73 samples from white-tailed deer, that's many more now, and also infections that have been uh, sequenced from domestic cats, domestic dogs, and also uh, big cats that were infected in zoos. And so just as before, we can ask, well, how do those animal infections fit into our understanding of the diversity we have circulating in humans? Now, this is a, another phylogenetic tree on the left, and I appreciate it looks really, really dense and a bit different to what you normally see, and that's purely because it has nearly 17,000 genomes in it, so it's... um quite hard to, to visualize. Um, but we can map onto this phylogenetic tree. So this is kind of animal, uh, human infections, where we find infections in animals. And the picture, so that's the dots, looks a little bit like this. So again, we have a kind of a just instant visual, visual patterning where we can see that it's not the case that there's only one viral lineage that can infect animals. Instead, it seems that there's a real propensity for SARS-CoV-2, any lineage, to potentially spill over into at least these uh, sequenced examples from different animal infections. Um, so I'm going to focus just on the mink and the deer, but given that we have the most, most data from them. And it looks a little bit like this. So the dark blue here is, is the mink. Hopefully you can see and the kind of dark purple is, is the deer. So again, you can see that this um, happens again and again, multiple, multiple times. And in terms of kind of our questions about, well, what happens when the virus spills over into a new host? We actually have multiple here independent examples. So um, this provides us multiple case studies across time. Now, if we were to look at, for instance, um, just kind of characterizing or estimating, it of course be an underestimate how many events we would suggest from this phylogenetic tree. We'd say there've been at least 22 independent spillover events into mink, at least seven um, into deer. And some of these gave rise to quite big clusters. So this is you know, data that's been sequenced and made available by groups around the world. But certainly there were clusters of up to say 300 sequenced infections in mink farms. So sometimes when these spillover events happen, they were really very successful. And so this gives you opportunities to ask the questions, a question about signatures are kind of repeated adaptation every time you have a spillover event into mink or in deer. And I'm gonna focus just on, on mink in the interests of time. And so we designed kind of a set of heuristics that uh, we felt might be able to capture some of the properties of the mutations that were appearing whenever these events happened. And these were all based on the principle of convergence. So every single time this virus spreads from humans into minks, we see the same mutation. So that was step one. So looking for homoplasic mutations in the tree. So you could imagine here, for example, this red mutation and this red mutation here are, are kind of independent events incongruent with the rest of the phylogeny. We also, in terms of looking for adaptive changes in the virus, were looking for cases where we had a differential allele frequency differentials. So looking at the frequency of the mutations we saw in animals compared to the frequency that we saw in humans. Um, so obviously a higher frequency in animals, or in this case, minks, would suggest that mutation is potentially advantageous. The inverse might suggest they're deleterious. And of course, if they're about equal, then, then all things being equal, we'd say that mutation was neutral. And then our final criteria was that we had to see that mutation be present in multiple independent outbreaks. So either on distinct mink farms where that information was available or in distinct countries. So together we had all these kind of criteria that was trying to pin down what we thought were the mutational changes that were needed in order for the virus to adapt to infect minks. And so here are the results, like I said, just, just for minks. So if we look, um, or if I just explain this plot briefly, so along the x-axis here, we have the allele frequency of the mutation in minks. On the y-axis, we have the allele frequency of the mutation in humans. So the black line is kind of what we'd expect if it kind of had a, a neutral scenario, with the red line being cases where we would have a twofold higher frequency in minks compared to what we would see in, in human viral lineages. 
And what I kind of hope is obvious is that we had this little window of uh, mutations where we see they occurred uh, multiple times. So every time there's a spillover into minks, we observe these mutations. They're at twofold higher allele frequency in minks compared to humans. Um, we had to see them three times. Um, and so these we think are good candidates as potentially um, adapt, uh, adaptive mutations. And um, if we applied our kind of final criteria, which is we needed to see these mutations and happening in like distinct farms or distinct countries, and um, that left us with five non-synonymous changes that we sort of believe might be very, very important during that very early transition from a human infection into an animal lineage. And very interestingly, three of those five mutations were found within the coronavirus spike protein, which I'm sure you've all heard of. It's the target used in, in the vaccines and also is the key kind of receptor, the spike on the coronavirus outer surface that allows the binding to the human receptor, which is in this case is a receptor called ACE2. Now, very interesting, these three mutations were found in um, what's considered the receptor binding domain. So the key kind of contact site of the spike protein receptor and the human receptor cell. And so this seems like they, you know, suggests to us that they could be functionally important. And actually following our work, there was a, a study done by Zua colleagues who looked at the entry efficiency of SARS-CoV-2 into ferrets, so admittedly not minks, but a close relative. And you can see under a wild type scenario that the entry compared to human entry in ferrets in the black was, was a lot less. But the acquisition of any one of those candidate mutations actually kind of improved the entry efficiency quite, quite a bit. So together, we think that might be quite strong evidence that we see these really early adaptive changes happening uh, during the transition to a new zoonotic host. And this is work that was led by a PhD student, uh, Cedric Tan. And so I have talked about how we can track zoonotic disease at multiple scales. So going from some of the oldest um, events all the way to some of the most recent and instantaneous events, but perhaps some of the kind of holy grail, I guess, if you work in um, infectious disease genomics, is whether it's possible to identify zoonotic pathogens before they even become a problem. So I've called this the something really new um, of the talk. And um, I'm just going to give you like a flavor of some work which we've done, which has tried to sort of scratch the surface of what is an, obviously that's a, an enormous question. And again, we can turn back to um, the coronaviruses. And so here is uh, a radial phylogenetic tree of the coronavirus family. And I think we've all heard so much about the coronavirus, we tend to forget that, of course, this includes very many species. Uh, the diversity is quite huge. So we have four genres, the alpha, uh, the beta, the the gamma and the delta uh, coronaviruses. And they're found um, across many, many different hosts. The outer ring here is given the different animals and indeed humans that, that they can infect. So this includes uh, coronaviruses of major veterinary importance, for example, porcine coronavirus, those of domestic cats, feline coronavirus, um, and of course, other human coronaviruses. So the human endemic coronaviruses, uh, OC43, HKU1, NL63, and 229E, which are responsible for maybe 15 to 30% of common colds. Um, SARS-CoV-2 sits here, so it sits within the beta coronaviruses, and in particular falls within a subclade, which is called the Sarbica viruses. And the reason I mention this in the context of kind of predicting zoonotic disease is that if we zoom in onto the Sarbica viruses, that includes SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-1 here is about 80% or so nucleotide uh, different. So this gives you kind of some sense of the scale. You can see that all the immediate relatives, so all the blue points in, in this phylogenetic tree are coronaviruses that have been isolated from bats. So taking just kind of genomic data uh, that exists today, looking at the kind of ancestral hosts and relationships, who you could kind of hypothesize that a good place for looking for uh, potentially concerning zoonotic threats might be to look, for instance, within bats. And so I was involved in a project together with the Bat Conservation Trust of in the UK, where um, a large scale effort was taken to uh, fully sequence a meta transcriptomic sequencing of uh, fecal uh, pellets from bats at, at many, many roosts around the UK. So this gives you a, a sense of the sampling um, and then the species. So this covered 16 of the 17 bat species that are currently known to breed um, within the UK. And by sampling the kind of fecal matter, the bats weren't sort of interacted with. So um, it gave us the possibility to kind of be as non-invasive as possible. Um, many of or nearly all of these species are, are under threat in order to sequence the, the RNA that was present. So just how we would mine that RNA, say from, uh, or DNA from ancient remains, we can do exactly the same 
thing with metagenomics data generated from kind of fecal material. Um, and in this case, identify the, the viruses or the bacteria that uh, were present. Um, very interesting, we found a lot of viruses. Most of those were insect viruses, so uh, you won't be surprised that bats eat a lot of insects. Um, but we also, in and amongst those sequencing reads, were able to identify the presence of a number of coronaviruses. And so um, that included um, four coronaviruses that would fall within this upper grouping. So this is the alpha coronaviruses, one coronavirus, which we would call a MERS-like coronavirus, so shows sequence similarity to the, the MERS clade or the Merbica viruses, and then four uh, novel Sarbica viruses, so this is the novel subgenus or the subgenus um, to which SARS-CoV-2 belongs. And so from those 48 samples, you know, we were able to find nine uh, coronavirus genomes that we could recover to, you know, a, a full quality. And amongst those two, so this one here and this one here, uh, we found weren't uh, closer than 80% identical to anything that had been sequenced before, so they could be classified as, as brand new species. And so I think this really highlights that, you know, using these types of techniques, you will keep discovering things. There's an awful lot of viruses out there. And certainly in our focus here was coronaviruses, but, you know, th there's real scope to use metagenomic or metatranscriptomic sequencing tools to discover kind of untapped um, diversity. Now, one key question, and I think we were particularly interested in the Sarbica viruses, given that the, the subgenus where we also have um, SARS-CoV-2, so we know that this is good evidence of, and SARS-1, so good evidence of viruses that can have epidemic or indeed pandemic um, potential, is simply, well, can they infect human cells? Should we be uh, concerned? And so this was a really nice project because generally my work kind of stops at the functional validation side of, of kind of the, the component of the project. But here we were able to work closely with Dr. Tom Peacock. He's just set up a group at the Perbright Institute to actually ask the question, well, do any of those four Sarbica viruses that we found in UK uh, bats, can they actually infect a human cell? So the way of doing this is to create a pseudovirus or an artificial spike protein that you can insert into a lentivirus uh, system and then try and get it to bind to the human receptor in the cell. So it's completely safe. This is a construct it can't replicate, but it allows you to ask this question about what's the relative entry efficiency of this virus. Now, really interestingly, um, when we did this, at least with one of our um, bat coronaviruses, um, we found that there was an entry efficiency providing we overexpressed the human ACE2 receptors that was reasonably comparable to, to what we see in SARS-CoV-2. So this is a quite complex plot, but here we have coronaviruses that are known to use ACE2. So here's SARS-CoV-2. This is kind of the benchmark. So this is human ACE2. And then here's our uh, British coronavirus that we found in bats. So you can see it can, you know, it can enter human cells. What is perhaps more reassuring is if we actually use kind of endogenous, so physiological levels of ACE2, that patterning went, to, went away. So here's our blue bar here, here's SARS-CoV-2 in green, and you can see in different cell lines, we, we weren't able to infect human cells. So our current kind of understanding here is that we have a virus that um, has what we would say zoonotic potential. It can't infect human cells yet at endogenous levels, but it's probably not that many mutations away from doing so. And so I think this kind of provides uh, or touches on a workflow where you can kind of think about how genomics can be used as a surveillance or sequencing tool to identify potential animal or wildlife reservoirs or environmental reservoirs to identify perhaps a, a set of viruses where we have prior knowledge that they may be important or risk, uh, might have some kind of risk profile associated to them and then deliver the functional follow-up to perhaps offer approach to stratifying our, our efforts in terms of tackling what will be a continual threat as we've seen through history of, of the emergence of new zoonotic disease. So just to close, I wanted to just like show, I guess, a blueprint of how we've been thinking a little bit about how we go about this. And I think one really important kind of pillar of genomic surveillance, and I think genomic surveillance is obviously going to become more and more common. Uh, certainly SARS-CoV-2 has, has catapulted what we can do in terms of genomic response um, is to think about the areas we should be surveying. And I think humans and domestic animals and wildlife and the environment all need to be part of this of this picture. And I kind of, when we put, I put this slide together, I was thinking about it in the context, of course, of how we tackle current disease. But I also think if we really want to get back to asking those questions about how long major pathogens have been infecting humans, um, how long they've been adapted to human infections, and these big questions about zoonotic reservoirs in the past for which there still remain major uncertainties, then perhaps a surveillance approach, which is multi-pronged like this, is, is also the way to go.
And so um, that kind of brings me to the end of the talk. And I realize I've taken you through a whistle stop tour of uh, zoonotic disease emerging at multiple scales. So as kind of a reminder, we really touched on at the beginning, the kind of um, the speculated co-divergent scenarios of some of these really intriguing childhood double-stranded DNA viruses with humans, finding that we can you know, detect really exceptionally old infections in, in uh, children's uh, teeth back in the Pleistocene. Um, and that we can take that work through all the way through to, to modern infections. Certainly, I think HSV-1 is a really interesting example where we clearly have a big lineage turnover event happening in, in history and does raise a lot of questions about how the role of our own migrations and behaviors might impact on the diversity of, of the bugs that we, we harbor. And then bringing you all the way up to date to, of course, our, our work on uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, thinking about how genomic tools can be used to um, utilize the, the biggest data sets out there to ask questions about how viruses are adapting and changing in terms of their, their fitness um, and also in their ability to infect different hosts. Um, so I'm going to finish uh, there. Um, I should thank a lot of people. Um, so um, particularly at University College London, where, where I'm based, I work very closely with Francois Ballou, and, and these are the kind of the members of my group. Cedric in particular has been really instrumental in all of the coronavirus work and is a really talented and a uh, student and a joy to work with. Um, of course, the University of Cambridge, so um, Freddie Scheib and, and Charlotte Hallcroft. Um, there's other names and I'll let you, you look at them. Um, and I should also thank Mary and me for organizing today as well. So thank you very much.